Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to have the task to speak about immune responses in CKD and ESKD here. And I thank the organizers very much for inviting me for this task. Well, uh, this is a large topic and there's much to say about. And I would like to start with the first of four chapters which is what are the clinical aspects of immunity in patients with chronic kidney disease and on dialysis. We did a study several years ago. Uh, part of this study was to uh, register what the hospital admission causes for patients on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis were. And you can see here the analysis there were different uh, causes of hospitalization. And I will highlight for you the important things in terms of discussing the immune defect. There were 15% of the uh, uh, hospitalizations caused by infections and another 6% by infections of the uh, catheters or the fistula. So more than 20% of hospitalizations were caused by infectious complications. This is also reflected in data from the USRDS. This is from the most recent USRDS report. And uh, here are the mortality causes in patients with ESKD. And uh, to make this diagram a little more uh, comprehensible, I highlight those aspects that are relevant for our discussion today. And you can see here that 7% of the patients died from infections, either pulmonary infections or septicemia. So infection is a relevant topic in patients with chronic renal failure, as you may know. What about CKD patients? A study on more than 5,000 participants of the cardiovascular health study with a long follow-up showed that infections are major causes for complications in these patients. You see on the left the all-cause infection uh, problems uh, according to EGFR with uh, darker bars for the lower EGFR. And uh, this is not distributed equally across all types of infections, since genitourinary and pulmonary infections were the drivers of complications in these patients. It's not surprising that urinary tract infections play a major role, but also pulmonary infections are very important in these patients. So what we see here is that infections are a common problem and there is a relevant mortality in our patients. What about prevention, for instance, by vaccinations? Well, one of the vaccinations that we deal with every year is influenza. I just put out one little uh, study here that deals with influenza vaccination, not because this study is particularly uh, relevant or large, but it points to some very important aspects of uh, influenza immunity after vaccination. You see on top here, the influenza IgG response in healthy individuals in uh, white and in uh, dialysis patients in black. There is a significant difference with low influenza uh, antibody titers and low persistence of this protective immunity. The study highlighted several other aspects. As you see in the lower panel, there was no difference in the IgA response. This might be highly important since IgA is the immunoglobulin that is secreted to the mucosa. And mucosal immunity most likely is not that influenced by uh, CKD and uh, ESKD as, is, uh, as are other aspects of immunity. And there's an important question uh, whether patients 
who do not mount a serologic response to influenza may have a cellular response and are protected anyway. And this study also checked if there is cellular immunity after influenza vaccination. And you can see on the right hand side in the lower panels that uh, both CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells hardly respond to the vaccination in hemodialysis patients. And the uh, conclusion from that is, uh, there is if there is no zero response to this vaccine, there's also no cellular response in the patients. You know another vaccination very well because you do that every day, uh, hepatitis B vaccination in patients with chronic renal failure. There are lots of studies on that aspect. And I only uh, took this uh, little study here because it used a newer adjuvanted vaccine that uh, came to better results than the standard vaccines. However, uh, even with this adjuvanted vaccine, the response rates and zero protection rates uh, in dialysis patients were lower as we know them in the healthy population. And you are very aware that uh, the hepatitis B vaccinations, the vaccines are uh, high dose vaccines and the vaccine schedules are extended in comparison to healthy individuals. So it's difficult to vaccinate patients against hepatitis B. There is another interesting vaccine in uh, patients uh, that we care for. It is the herpes zoster vaccine. The panel shows the results of the herpes zoster, the recombinant, the newer herpes zoster vaccine in uh, healthy individuals uh, over the age of 70. These were not CKD patients. This is the healthy population. And the panel shows the astonishing uh, effects of this uh, vaccine. The efficacy was 89%. The uh, occurrence of new flares of herpes zoster in uh, these elderly population was uh, uh, remarkably reduced. So it's a very effective vaccine. What about using this vaccine in patients with chronic renal failure? We do not have data on the recombinant vaccine, but we have data on the slightly older a living attenuated vaccine against Zoster. And this is shown in the right-hand panel. You see there is efficacy uh, in reducing uh, Zoster flares, but most likely it is not that effective as it is in the healthy population. There are vaccines in dialysis patients that work very well. For instance, vaccination against pneumococci. This is a study showing the pneumococcus uh, antibodies against the different serotypes at baseline and after four and 52 weeks after the vaccination. And you see there is a response. The response uh, is not the same to all serotypes, but there is a response. So maybe we conclude this clinical part here in saying there are different responses to vaccination in patients with chronic renal failure. Some of these antigens that are used for vaccination, in particular viral antigens, influenza, hepatitis B, need to be processed by monocytes, by antigen presenting cells. And these antigens are then presented towards T lymphocytes, they get the signaling, and this signaling, as we may learn later on, is inadequate in dialysis patients, but uh, the uh, antigens are presented. These T cells are activated, they provide help to B lymphocytes for antigen production, and that is what we measure as the a result of vaccination, the specific antibodies. There are several yellow fields here indicating that uh, some of these functions are impaired or disturbed in patients with CKD. 
On the other hand, and shown on the right side, there are several large polysaccharide antigens. The prototype is uh, pneumococci uh, antigens. And they can be recognized by B lymphocytes without the help of APC or T cells. And this leads to a perfectly well antibody production also in CKD patients. So the defect is either on the level of the APC or the T lymphocyte. So to conclude the first chapter, infections contribute heavily to morbidity and also to mortality in our patients. Vaccinations have difficulties and there is uncertainty about the vaccination protection. And we cannot measure the titers routinely in our patients. Vaccine studies suggest that the severe impairment is on the side of the T lymphocyte or their activating mechanisms. And this is relevant, for instance, for influenza and hepatitis B. And there is mucosal immunity and B cell function which is at least less compromised in CKD, and that is relevant for pneumococcus. Let's get to the second chapter. We uh, have heard about T lymphocyte function in CKD patients, and now it's the time to look into more detail. When you look into the literature on T cell function in CKD, you often find descriptions of surface molecule expression and function in these cells. For instance, this study that shows differences between T lymphocyte phenotypes in uh, patients with ESRD just before starting dialysis and those who are dialyzed for a few weeks. And uh, these, oh, I don't want to go into details of this study, but only say that the phenotypic uh, differences are described as if these cells were a homogeneous population that uh, has a defect or uh, an altered expression of several antigens. This is difficult because we have to consider that uh, all these cells are derived from a very uh, variable phenotypes. There are naive T cells, there are antigen experienced T cells, there are uh, immature and there are mature antigen uh, experienced cells. And depending on which cell type you find and how many of these cells you find in the circulation, the expression pattern of surface molecules and also the production of cytokines can be largely different. And this is shown here, the expression pattern of different antigens on the surface of these cells is largely different if you have a naive cell or a young or an older um, antigen experience T lymphocyte. So we cannot conclude from a finding of, uh, anti of uh, antigens on the surface of these cells uh, that uh, we already have uh, seen the defect in these uh, cell, cell types and in these patients. Furthermore, lymphocytes fall into a lot of different subsets with different function and also different surface molecule expression. For instance, the Th1 or Th2 type of T cells that highly differ in their cytokine production pattern or the T regulatory cells or cells that provide help for B cell activation. As you see in this cartoon, there are a lot of cytokines that are involved in the differentiation of the lymphocyte into the one or the other subset. And uh, these uh, cytokines are cytokines that we know very well in patients with chronic kidney disease since they form the inflammatory milieu of CKD and ESKD patients. In particular, IL-6, IL-4, IL-12 or TNF-alpha are highly um, retained by chronic kidney disease and by kidney failure. And 
Well, this pro-inflammatory milieu has influence on the differentiation of T lymphocytes. So it may well be that the inflammatory milieu is one of the causes why we see differences in T cell differentiation in these patients when compared to healthy people. For instance, a lot of years ago, we uh, looked at the Th1, Th2 differentiation pattern in lymphocytes of uh, hemodialysis patients. And well, uh, without going into too much detail, you can see here that the Th2 population is expanded while the Th1 population is not expanded. And this leads to an alteration in the balance between Th1 and Th2 in the lymphocytes of these patients. And the cause we could clearly show in this situation was the high expression of the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-12, which is a typical hallmark of chronic renal failure. And if you inhibit IL-12, you get a normal T-cell differentiation. There are also functional studies in lymphocytes. And one of the very old ones from the 1990s from our group was uh, to show that the um, uh, secondary signaling pattern of antigen presenting cells is defect in chronic renal failure. And if you replace these uh, secondary signals, you can normalize the proliferative index or the function of T lymphocytes also in these patients. So, to activate a T lymphocyte, you need the antigen presenting cell that provides the primary signal via the antigen presented on an MHC molecule towards the T cell receptor. And you need a secondary signal that tells the T cell what to do to get activated or to get inactivated. And this secondary signal, one of these secondary signals contains the CD86 molecule that needs to be presented to the T cell. We could show uh, that uh, in patients with chronic renal failure, the secondary signal via the CD86 molecule is diminished and the T cell gets low signaling for activation. And this may be one cause why there is T cell dysfunction in chronic renal failure. And if you choose your experimental conditions in a way that the secondary signal can be provided, for instance, by antibodies or by transfecting cells with high expression of CD86, you can normalize the T cell function in patients with chronic renal failure. Nothing remains of this defect on the T cell level if you provide the normal signaling environment to these cells. There is one further aspect to be considered when speaking about T cells, and that is apoptosis. The circulating number of T cells and the populations are influenced by this programmed cell death. Programmed cell death means that these cells uh, are inactivated and uh, removed from the circulation. This uh, cartoon is a little bit small, but it should show that uh, every column is higher for ESRD than healthy control, indicating that in all the experimental conditions and the subpopulation studied here, the apoptosis rate in T cells was higher in uh, CKD patients than in the healthy counterparts. So the uh, removal and uh, apoptosis of T cells plays a role as well. On top of that, a dialysis session can induce some kind of uh, apoptosis in these cells as well. So that it is important to consider dialysis technique and the time point of dialysis uh, when you study T cell function. To conclude, um, enhanced apoptosis also influences 
the cell population distribution that we can test when we draw uh, blood samples from our patients. So let me conclude this uh, second uh, chapter of uh, this uh, talk here. We saw that T lymphocyte uh, dysfunction is present and it uh, most likely is relevant to the clinical immune defect. However, uh, these data have to be interpreted with care since uh, the uh, circulating T lymphocytes are influenced by the extrusion from bone marrow and lymphoid organs, the production of these cells, the differentiation under the most likely inflammatory milieu in our patients. And this inflammation comes from the uh, kidney failure. And the activation is influenced by the defect antigen presenting cells. And there's also cellular aging and apoptosis that leads to a faster removal of these cells from the circulation. The finding that the replacement of APC signaling replaces or compensates most of the T cell defect let me think that uh, maybe there is no intrinsic T cell defect, but uh, the T cell is uh, subject to the inflammatory milieu and the defect antigen presenting cell. Well, now let's turn to the monocytes, macrophages, the professional antigen presenting cells, at least in the circulation, there are other antigen presenting cells in the body that may be even more important, but these can be studied. And me and my group have done this now for some uh, 20 years. And uh, so we are very interested in these uh, little cell type uh, that seems to carry a lot of the problems in uh, chronic kidney disease. Monocytes are a very heterogeneous population and they have very diverse uh, tasks in the body. You see on top that they are relevant for antigen presentation. This is the situation that we have discussed uh, uh, just before when T cells get activated. However, monocytes are also relevant for um, the vascular integrity. And this is a very interesting uh, topic that I would like to talk about a few minutes now because the cells uh, patrol the vascular endothelium. They look for damaged endothelium and this physiologically is part of wound healing and repair. In our patients, these uh, physiologic mechanisms turn into a pathologic one in that uh, monocytes uh, transmigrate the vascular wall and form atherosclerotic plaques. When talking about monocytes, we also have to take in mind that there is a large monocyte reservoir in the body. There are more cells in uh, reservoir organs such as the spleen than in the circulation. And they can be uh, liberated from the spleen within a few minutes to replenish the circulation. So we also have to think about cells that are not visible to our tests, but that are uh, present in the body. So now let's get to atheroma formation and the role of monocytes in that pathologic process. You see on the left, a monocyte attached to endothelial cells. It rolls along the endothelium and uh, if it finds a defect endothelial cell, it transmigrates in the subendothelial space, differentiates into macrophages there, takes up a lot of cholesterol and lipids and forms the lipid rich core of an inflammatory plaque. This process of uh, uh, moving along the endothelial wall uh, was beautifully shown by a, a group from Canada uh, several years ago. Uh, they used intravital microscopy and you see here a red stained aorta of a rat 
and the green monocytes that move along the endothelium, they also move against the bloodstream and patrol along the endothelium to find uh, damage here uh, where they can move into the subendothelial space. The literature is full of uh, findings on uh, surface molecule expression and uh, cytokine production in uh, monocytes from ESKD patients. I had the task to review that in a systematic review earlier this year, and you see these large tables showing that there is a plethora of different alterations, mostly pointing to the fact that this cell type is activated and has a pro-inflammatory phenotype. <clears throat> Monocytes are also not a single monolithic uh, cell population, but they fall into three uh, different uh, subpopulations, and it is very uh, important and relevant to distinguish these populations. We can do that by flow cytometry after staining monocytes for the LPS receptor CD14 and the receptor for the FC part of the human immunoglobulin G, which is the CD16. The majority of monocytes stain positive for CD14. This population is termed MO1. Two Smaller populations stain positive also for CD16, and they differ in the expression density of CD14. And these cells are highly interesting, as I may say, uh, show in the next few slides. Since they are pro-inflammatory, they are uh, aggressive cells, and they are also relevant for antigen presentation. Well. Uh, Adam Savada from uh, the Homburg group in Germany showed a few years ago that these three monocyte subpopulations are highly uh, heterogeneous in terms of uh, surface marker expression and function. For instance, in the middle panel, you see the expression density of HLA-DR, the receptor that presents antigen to the T lymphocyte. And you see the MO2 population is the one that uh, has the professional task to provide antigen presentation to the T cells. On the right hand, you see two panels with the expression density of adhesion molecules that are relevant for the endothelial adhesion and the uh, rolling and transmigration process I showed earlier in the vessel wall. We studied the, uh, the uh, population numbers in terms of absolute cell numbers and relative cell numbers and compared the three populations, MO1 through MO3, uh, in healthy individuals and in patients on dialysis. And you see in this uh, diagram that the populations MO2 and MO3 are expanded in the patients while the MO1 population is uh, lower. So what does this mean? This means that the pro-inflammatory cell type is expanded and uh, one may, might speculate that this is associated with more uh, atherosclerotic vessel disease and impaired uh, immunity in terms of antigen recognition and immune response. Dr. Heine from our group showed that indeed the number of MO2 cells in the population is related to the cardiovascular event rate in patients on chronic hemodialysis. So there may be uh, some truth in the finding that the MO2 population is particularly relevant for uh, the um, immune function and atherosclerosis. There is more with this MO2 population than only uh, production of cytokines. Uh, 
uh, you see here the expression of the angiotensin converting enzyme on the surface of these monocyte populations. You may be surprised hearing that these cells express ACE and hormone uh, um, um, a, uh, an enzyme that you know from um, blood pressure regulation. But it is well known that ACE ACE expression on monocytes is highly relevant for their pro-inflammatory activation. And another finding is that the expression of the lipoprotein lipase A2 uh, is also different on the monocytes from patients with chronic renal failure. And uh, Dr. Ulrich from my group could show that the expression density is highly correlated with the presence or absence of atherosclerotic plaques in the vasculature of the patients. So MO2 and MO3 are the most interesting cell types here, and they are the ones that express high levels of ACE and LP play too. Could this be relevant for uh, atherosclerosis? Yes, most likely it is. You see here that uh, in the uh, wall of an atherosclerotic plaques, you can find a high number of monocytes and of macrophages that are derived from monocytes. And these macrophages carry on their surface a high expression level of angiotensin uh, converting enzyme. And also, you find the localization of LP plate 2 in the atherosclerotic plaque of uh, the vessel. So it's highly likely that the high expression of ACE and lipoprotein lipase A2 is relevant for the effect of monocytes on the growth of atherosclerotic plaques. How could chronic renal failure induce these alterations in monocytes? Well, one experiment was to incubate monocytes with sera from patients with chronic renal failure or uh, in experimental conditions with typical uh, uremic toxins such as uh, paracresyl sulfate. On the left-hand panel, you see that the incubation of monocytes with uh, patient sera leads to a steep increase in the expression density of angiotensin-converting enzyme. And furthermore, in the right panel, uh, this expression of ACE is associated with a, a much stronger adherence of monocytes to endothelium, uh, as also shown in the immunofluorescence patterns here. So uremic serum induces a phenotype in monocytes that is highly likely to promote atherosclerosis. That's what we find. Uremic serum induces these typical monocytes alterations. But what about the dialysis procedure? Does it uh, induce monocyte alteration or does it heal this problem? Well, this is very difficult to study. And so I have, I have to introduce a new level of uh, uh, diff difficulties here. Um, the monocytes pass through the hollow fiber membrane of the dialyzer. And when doing so, they become activated. They express higher levels of adhesion molecules, uh, such as CD11B or CD18. And when they uh, get to the next endothelial um, uh, surface, which usually is the endothelium in the lung, they adhere there. They are removed from the circulation. They are no longer available for us to study in the circulation. We cannot see these cells. This is uh, found as a steep decline of uh, monocyte numbers in the circulation 
within the first 15 to 30 minutes of a dialysis session. Thereafter, the cell numbers recover, most likely by uh, extrusion of new monocytes from the spleen and other reservoirs in the body, and not the cells that have adhered to the endothelium of the lung. So it's nearly impossible to study the activation level of monocytes that uh, have recently passed the dialyzer membrane because we simply don't get them when drawing blood samples from our patients. The consequence is dialyzer biocompatibility may play a role in monocyte alteration. It definitely plays a role in monocyte population dynamics, but it is very difficult to study that aspect. So let me conclude with the third chapter. Monocytes are most likely involved in immune dysfunction in that they give co-stimulatory signals to T lymphocytes. They are definitely involved in inflammation since they produce a lot of cytokines and they are um, most likely producing higher levels of cytokines in CKD and ESKD patients than in healthy individuals. And they are also involved in atherosclerosis, most likely by carrying destabilizing enzymes such as ACE and LP plate 2 into the atherosclerotic plaque. The high level of monocyte activity is due to the enhanced activation level of each single cell and also by the expansion of the functionally distinct and pro-inflammatory MO2 population. And about the causes of these monocyte alterations, this may very well be retention of immune proteins, cytokines that are uh, excreted and metabolized by the healthy kidney and that accumulate during CKD and by uremic toxins such as paracresyl sulfate. The role of dialysis is difficult to study. So let's come to the last chapter of this talk. Uh, what are the th potential therapeutic interventions that we can work on? Well, I talked about the retention of cytokines and proteins that are cleared by the healthy kidney. These cytokines and proteins are typically in a molecular weight range between, let's say, 10 and 25 kilodalton. This is a range that is not very well cleared by the typical dialysis membrane. You see here the spectrum of uh, proteins that I'm talking about. The high flux membrane can only remove uh, some of these proteins, but cannot uh, uh, change the retention of these uh, cytokines very much. There are other membranes in the market right now that uh, have a higher cutoff and can clear proteins with molecular weight of, let's say, 15 kilodalton. And uh, these membranes are likely to remove cytokines and uh, other monocyte-derived mediators from the circulation. The problem in some of these uh, products may be the loss of albumin, but uh, there are already membranes that uh, have a low albumin loss and can clear cytokines. We were luck lucky to have the chance to do a clinical study program with uh, such membranes and uh, compared in an open label randomized controlled trial with uh, four weeks of treatment with a high cutoff membrane in chronic hemodialysis patients and compared this to a high flux dialysis. And the result after four weeks of treatment is shown in this picture. It shows, shows you the gene activation profile uh, of pro-inflammatory cytokines, mediators, and surface molecules uh, in uh, 
uh, cells that were incubated with uh, sera from hcot treated patients in comparison with those uh, treated with high flux dialysis and it's easy to see that there are a lot of uh, proteins and a lot of genes that are downregulated after HCO dialysis. And this is an indication that we can uh, reduce inflammation, that we can improve uh, cellular function by uh, clearing these retained cytokine proteins uh, through dialysis. There's one other approach that I would like to uh, discuss with you at the end of this talk. The angiotensin system uh, could be addressed by therapy um, in inhibiting both the uh, ACE and the angiotensin receptor. But there's more with this system that is relevant to our discussion, uh, particularly on monocytes. I show you here the complete angiotensin system as we know it uh, by now. Uh, the ACE is the molecule that cleaves the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and angiotensin 2 binds to its receptors, inducing inflammation in the monocyte. However, angiotensin 2 is cleared by another enzyme, which is termed angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, and this is also expressed on the surface of the monocyte. The cleavage product is called angiotensin 1 to 7. And this angiotensin 1 to 7 binds to a particular receptor on the cell and has anti-inflammatory properties. Why do I tell you all of that? Because it shows that the balance between the expression of ACE and ACE2 is most likely very important for the uh, effect that this system has on inflammation. And Dr. Trojanovic from my group could recently show that uh, uremic sera and in particular paracresyl sulfate as a a typical uremic toxin can induce the pattern that we find on monocytes from hemodialysis patients. The pattern is low expression of ACE and um, uh, high expression of ACE, sorry, and low expression of ACE2, the pro inflammatory pattern. And this can be induced by paracrasyl sulfate or uremic serum. And it is mediated by a microRNA, the microRNA421, uh, that uh, can by itself induce these alterations and induce inflammation. So we have a system here that we can address pharmacologically that is very relevant to monocyte activation and inflammation in these patients. Maybe we can in the future develop uh, therapy that uh, acts anti-inflammatory and acts against this uh, particular uh, pathogenesis of inflammation in CKD patients. So let me sum up what the potential targets for therapy might be. First, we know now that uremic toxins via a mechanism involving a particular microRNA uh, influence the balance between ACE and ACE2 on uh, monocytes of dialysis patients. Uh, the angiotensin 1 to 7, the degradation product of angiotensin 2, may be involved and is relevant for that. And this in, uh, mechanism is uh, very relevant for the limitation on, of inflammation. And most likely, this can be addressed as a pharmacologic target. Second, we have the cytokines that are retained in chronic renal failure and that induce uh, uh, monocyte differentiation and uh, population shifts and uh, further inflammatory activation. This might be addressed by specific uh, developments in dialysis technique. And furthermore, we have the dialyzer membrane contact 
it is hard to study that, but it is also relevant for monocyte activation. And uh, most likely we could improve the um, activation process by dialyzer membrane uh, and uh, reduce the pro-inflammatory effect there. So this slide should be my summary for therapy. And I would conclude my ta talk here, but not without a thank to all the many people who helped uh, collecting all those interesting data. These are my collaborators from the university here at Halle Saale, uh, together with the Institute for Nutrition Science and the Institute for Food Chemistry here, and colleagues from the University of the Saarland and from the Charité in Berlin. Thank you very much, and I thank you for listening to my talk.